It is with enormous pleasure that I introduce uh, this evening Enrique Peñalosa. Uh, Enrique is a good friend of LSE and of LSE cities. He is best known for, uh, to us as uh, the former mayor of Bogota, a position that he held with enormous distinction and effect from 1998 to 2001. A few years before Enrique's election, I had the pleasure of visiting Bogota to lecture at the Los Andes and at the Tadeo universities. The city then had a reputation for a degree of good governance. Its utility companies were more effective than most of those that I was familiar with in much of the rest of Latin America. Large infrastructure and private redevelopment schemes were much more likely to get off the planner's drawing table, certainly, certainly compared to Mexico where I'd spent the previous years. Talking about taxation was not entirely taboo. The economy was doing well, even if, in, even if inequality was a major problem, as was land tenure insecurity and, of course, crime and violence. And although this was some time before I began working on uh, violence in Latin America and on gangs in particular, I still remember visiting and spending half a day in the Calle Cartucho that was very memorable. I still bear the mental scars. <coughs> Within less than a decade, and taken in the period of Enrique's administration, however, this impressive city was further transformed. The Transmillennial Mass Transit System, a series of public parks, cycleways, and my personal favourites, the library projects, of which I'm sure we'll hear about, are standout examples. They've become attractive examples of urban interventions to mayors across Latin America and beyond. In Alejandro González Señorito's film Amores Peros, one of the characters says the line, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. With stereotypical fatalism, the film suggests it is best either not to be a planner, have plans, have hopes, or have visions, or if you do harbour such desires, not to tell anyone, especially not God. To be a successful city mayor, you need plans. In order to get these plans acted upon, requires the imagination for them to be communicated. To some extent, this ability rests on personal skills, and skills that perhaps Mr. Peñalosa learned at Duke University, where he studied economics and history, or at Paris, where he gained an MBA, and according to his website, he learned how to wash up in restaurants. Perhaps it's due to charisma, which Weber noted as a gift from God. But more fundamentally, it seems to me to be based on an understanding of politics. Without further delay, then, I give you Enrique Peñolosa, who will speak to us tonight to the subject of politics, power, cities. Thank you very much, Mr Peñolosa. much, Garrett, uh, and uh, I am very thankful to all of you, and my very good friend, the Colombian ambassador, tells me this is the first time you're going to listen to me speaking softly. <laughs> I have a bad London cold, but I hope we can do okay. And I'd like to thank very much the LSE Cities program, my friend Richard Sennett, Philip Road, Ricky Burdett. It's a team of people I have traveled all over the world with, and I have enjoyed myself very much and learned a lot. But of course, all the things I say that you disagree with is not because of their fault. And uh, I am going to refer a lot to Bogota, but I do not want you to think in terms of Bogota. I am thinking of mostly cities in general and mostly developing country cities. Over the next 30 years, according to the United Nations, there will be about 2 billion new inhabitants in developing country cities. But more than that, the, as homes become smaller, 
for example, going from five persons per home to three, for example, in Scandinavia now, it's only half of the homes only have one person. More than 25 have only two. So as homes become smaller, we will need to build more and more and more. So what I think is fascinating is that developing country cities should not only be good, but they should even be better in many ways than advanced cities in some uh, kind of infrastructure and projects. Because also it's clear that whatever is going to happen with world social and environmental sustainability is going to depend on what is to happen there. <coughs> I like this picture, wonderful picture of planet Earth from uh, space because once we see this, we feel this is this is self-sufficient spaceship floating in the immensity of the universe with, without known destination, and then we feel very close to each other. You know, we share this fragile Earth, all of us. But once we come down, we realize we do not share it really that much. For example, if you are a Colombian, it's extremely difficult to get a visa to go most places in the world. <laughs> so, but, uh, and even within our own countries, especially in some more than others, we cannot enter private property because all is private property. We cannot enter. We enter and we get killed. Some very civilized countries, such as Scandinavian countries, allow people to walk through private property and even to camp without asking permission, but that's still very rare. This is an interesting discussion that has been going on in Britain, but this is far from going on in developing countries where you can really get shot, but in the United States, even more so. <coughs> so, and then we go to our cities. And in our cities, we see that there is also private space. This is the building, <coughs> the private spaces, and then basically the roads. But then if you go to the private space in the cities, you also get killed. And if you go to the streets, you also get killed. So all I'm trying to emphasize is that out of this whole planet, really, the only microscopic piece to which we really have access is public pedestrian space in our cities. So it's an extremely important part of our planet. And I wish we would give it the importance it deserves. And that's a lot what we are going to talk about. But of course, transport. It's a very interesting issue because transport is the main challenge to most developing societies. But can we, I, I very often I go to talk about transport in developing countries, but I say, look, I cannot make any suggestions to you unless we have an idea of what kind of a city you want. Because it's very different, the, 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 the transport model, if what we have in mind is something like Atlanta or Houston, than if what we have in mind is something more like Amsterdam. So, but even more, even before we know what kind of city we want, we almost have to know how do we want to live. Because really, a city is only a means to a way of life. A city is a means to a way of life. So, you start, when we talk about transfer, we start talking about something that seems that will get us closer to transport engineer, but we end up some closer to religion than to transport engineer. What is it that makes us happy? What kind of city is the city that will make us happier? Democracy. We are not, I'm not communist or any such thing, but what does democracy mean? It's not just the fact that people go vote. In democracy, the first article in all constitutions say, the first article in, I don't know, the British constitution, not the French one, but I'm sure that in some way or another, the first article everywhere says all citizens are equal before the law. And if all citizens are equal before the law, it's not just poetry. This has very powerful implications. If all citizens are equal before the law, for example, a bus with 100 passengers has a right to 100 times more road space than a car with one person. This is not communism. This is basic democracy. A child in a tricycle has the same right to road space as a car owner. Equality. Many people thought that after communism failed, that we could forget about equality, that this is something of the past, some crazy things of some crazy people. But if we really think about it, 
we have been seeking equality for the la more than 2,000 years. I mean, I would almost say that the Western civilization grew out of this basic concept of equality. I mean, Greeks, the Romans, Judeo-Christian principles, and then over the last 300 years, all kinds of conflicts, revolutions. So it's not all of the sudden we can just what, what happened? It, we can just forget about equality. Uh, but clearly it's not income equality that we can have because we all agree that the best way to manage most of society's resources is private property and the market. It's the best way to manage most of society's resources. But the problem with this is that this creates inequality. For the market to work, some people have to make more money, some corporations make more money, some others go broke. So what kind of equality can we talk about if we cannot talk about income equality? It's not income equality. What kind of equality? So I will propose to you two things. First, that public good prevails over private interest. This is, again, a basic democratic principle which stems from that that all citizens are equal before the law. And the other one, which is very basic, we can uh, hope to have equality of quality of life, at least for children, at least for children. This is possible, even in the most radically capitalistic society. But often injustice is very much before our noses. When we talk about what happened in the French Revolution, we say, I mean, this was completely ridiculous. It was obvious that these things had to change. I mean, it was so gross injustice. But it was not so obvious because they had lived with this for 1,000 years and they thought this was normal, that they should pay taxes to the lord, the nobles and all kinds of crazy things. Today, for example, we have private property in the Long Island Sound and it's completely undemocratic in my opinion because if public good prevails over private interest, the waterfront along Long Island Sound in uh, up northern New York or even farther north clearly should be public. So it's not such a democratic society, except that we have been so used to such absurd, unjust, and undemocratic organization that we think this is normal. The same thing as with the French Revolution. is The injustices are before our noses, but we don't even see them because we are used to them. And I believe, and this is why I am here trying to convince you of a couple of things, that cities can be very powerful means to construct equality and inclusion. The main obstacles to creating equality in, to create inequality cities is inequality. Private land, as we will talk, is the cause for slums everywhere in the world. Upper income citizens do not want to use public transport. So this is, I mean, if we were to use, if everybody was willing to use buses in, 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 a, in a few months, we solve all the mobility problems of any city with exclusive lanes for buses. It's just that the upper income people don't want to do that. <laughs> private waterfronts, cars on sidewalks. The upper income people in Beijing or in uh, Chengdu, or they think they are of a higher class if they have a car, so they park on the sidewalk. Gated communities, shopping malls, and so on, and so on, and so on. What is a good city? I love the definition of this wonderful Danish urbanist, which is called Jan Gehl, that says a good city is one where people love to be outside of home, not inside in a mall, not at home, but outside in parks, in silos. And in order to find criteria for what a good city is, what is it that we need beyond survival, beyond water supply and those things, happiness needs. We need to be with people. We need to walk. Not in order to survive. We could, we could survive inside an apartment all our lives. But clearly, we are much better off if the sidewalk is 10 meter wide than if it's only 2 meter wide. And here we enter a realm that much of the things that have to do with cities are very subjective. It's very interesting because government has to intervene. Society has to intervene. We cannot let just the owners do whatever they want, to do any buildings of any height they want, or to do the sidewalks of any height uh, wide they want. But it's a very subjective decision. How, what is the height that you allow? So it's a very fascinating issue, and also cities we, and people need not to feel inferior. And this is something that people feel much better if, for example, rich and poor meet in public transport, in public spaces, and so on. These wonderful cities were, for example, here, people, a city that is good for children, for the elderly, for the poor, is good for everybody else. But of course, the people who least participate in how cities are designed are children, the elderly, the handicapped, and the poor. 
mostly it's upper middle class males who design cities, upper middle class people's pressures who design how developing country cities are created. Children never are taken into account. If we tell a three-year-old child today, anywhere in the world, watch out, a car, the child jumps in fright. And with a good reason, because there are tens of thousands of children killed by cars every year. But the most amazing thing is that we think this is normal. I mean, we think, our, we are so advanced that we think it's normal. Look, one time I saw a documentary about some herons in the Brazilian uh, Pantanal. And I was very impressed because as the baby herons were learning to fly, they would fall into the water, some of them. And as soon as they would touch the water, they would some crocodiles that would devour the uh, herons. So I felt very sympathetic and to the herons, of course. I mean, as a parent, they say, how horrible. But then I realized this is exactly, this is exactly how children grow in our cities. In terror of getting killed, and we think this is normal. We still talk about wolves. Even in Colombia, where we never had wolves, for example, we tell the children about wolves, and they, because it's Western civilization somehow, or in civilization, and they, <coughs> people get scared. Children, get, because there were a few children that were eaten by wolves in the Middle Ages in Northern Europe. But I can assure you that they are, on any given month in our time, there are more children killed by cars in a month than were killed by wolves all through the Middle Ages. <laughs> and people think it's normal. So in a, this is an ancient Chinese city, maybe not with bicycles, but a child could walk safe. Uh, this is new, this thing of being afraid. A city friendly to people or a city friendly to cars? Because there are conflicts. It's not like we can, oh, it can be good for everybody. No, it's not so much because high velocity urban roads are like fences in a cow pasture. It, it, it makes the city more and more difficult. It restricts our freedom. Clearly, there is a conflict for space. Look at this. Cars above, cars below. They were very generous to leave a little space here for human beings. <laughs> <laughs> or this, you know. And then, of course, people think this is progress. This is upper income people in these cities think this is progress. This is, this is shown. The mayor is very proud to have built these kind of things. I would say that a measure for anything to be done in a city is, does it make the city more or less pleasant to walk? To me, that would be the main measure. Anything, to a new building, a park, some transport system, a road, does it make the city more pleasant to walk or less pleasant to walk? The fact is that there is no such a thing as a natural level of car use in a city. I mean, if there was more space for cars, there would be more cars in London. If there were less space for cars, there would be less cars. Never has a city solved its traffic problems making bigger roads. So this is a political decision. How much space do we want to give to cars? This is not a technical decision. This is a political decision. Oh, what happens? Oops. He got blocked. I wonder. Do you think there is nothing else? Oh, yes, there is something else. Yes, <laughs> Transport is a very peculiar problem because most problems developing country cities have tend to be solved as societies become richer. Health and nutrition, education tends to get better as we are richer. But transport is the opposite. As we get richer, we get more and more traffic jams, more pollution, more of a mess. So clearly it's a very special problem. And trying to solve traffic jams with more or bigger roads is like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. <laughs> In the United States for the last 40 years, they have been following. And every city has been increasing the time lost in traffic jams despite giant highways everywhere. In Canada also, except in Vancouver, which has not allowed uh, the, the provincial government and the national government to build highways. And so this is the only place where time traffic jams and times in travel times have not increased. So why? 
This is something very important, and I wish developing country people would understand it. Traffic is not created by the number of cars. I mean, there are some counterintuitive truths. I mean, for example, if I had not been told, I would have never guessed that it was the Earth that went around the sun, and not vice versa. I would have never understood that. <laughs> so some things seem to be, but are not. So it seems to us that making bigger roads solves traffic jam, but it doesn't. Why? Because what creates traffic is not the number of cars. It's the number of trips and the length of trips. For example, for traffic, it is exactly the same to have 10 cars doing one kilometer each as to have one car doing 10 kilometers. It, it occupies the same amount of road space. So this is why never has building bigger roads or new roads solved traffic jams. Never. On the contrary, because as soon as bigger roads are built, people go farther and farther and make more trips, so it never works. Like in the United States, it's very interesting that if we go to New York or to London or to Paris and we talk to the Secretary of Transport and we, take, we talk transport policy, immediately what they understand is how to reduce car use. But if we go to a developing country, it's exactly the opposite. How to solve traffic jams, which in fact is how to facilitate car use. Mobility and traffic jams are two different problems which require two different solutions. We do not solve, I mean mobility, the only way to solve mobility is with public transport. Subways, bus systems, this will solve mobility, but it will not solve traffic jams. This is why London, one of the cities which had the most sophisticated network of uh, subway and trains in the world, it has to uh, charge congestion charge. So you will solve mobility, but you will not solve traffic jams. The only way to solve traffic jams is restricting car use. And the way to restrict car use, the most obvious way, is to restrict parking. Whenever you are going to restrict parking, like the mayor of Paris has taken out like 14,000 parking places and spots in the street over the last five or six years to make bigger sidewalks, and people of course protest. Hey, where are they going to park? So I think the mayor should tell them, look, in no constitution in the planet, you don't, I mean, you find, especially in the developing world, there are so many rights, rights to everything, not so many obligations, <laughs> but rights a lot. <laughs> but not even in the most generous constitution do you find that is included the right to park. <laughs> this is not a constitutional right anywhere. So the mayor, can, if, the, if somebody tells him, where am I going to park now? The mayor can tell him, look, this is not my problem. It's the same as if you ask me, where, do you, where should you keep your food or your clothes? This is not my problem, you know. This is it's a political decision of society. All I'm trying to say, I'm not saying it should have bigger sidewalks. Maybe not, but what I'm trying to emphasize is that this is a political decision, not a technical decision. Here, this is a real picture. When you invest a lot in this and not here, you end up electing Mr. Chavez. I don't know if it's good. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not going to say if it's good or it's bad. All I'm saying is the cost, the cost clearly. There is a conflict for money. Venezuela for many years invested a lot in this and very little in this. And then clearly there is a conflict for, for, for money and for space between, I mean the real class conflict today is not the Marxian class conflict between proletarians and capitalists and all this story oh, that was very beautiful, no. The real class conflict in developing countries it is between car owners and those who do not own cars. And in developing countries, almost by definition, only a minority owns cars. And clearly, you invest, you give, it's a conflict for space and for money. If you don't invest in all your money in highways, you can invest, for example, in these nurseries that we built. We decided we were not going to follow the Japanese cooperation agency's recommendation to invest like $20 billion on highways and elevated highways, like eight elevated highways through the city and all this, but rather to restrict car use and to invest in things like this. Nurseries, children nurseries, uh, many fantastic schools, by the way, with an interesting scheme of management through which some of the best private schools manage these poor schools in the poorest neighborhoods. Uh, you see, this is the things you can do 
And Bogotá now has built maybe at least 130, 140 high quality schools in the poorest neighborhoods. Because basically, it took a decision to invest a little less in highways and a little more in schools. And, and uh, 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 more than 400,000 people are visiting our libraries every month. We built first three big ones and 12 smaller ones, and now a big uh, Colombian businessman donated another fourth one. And I don't know, these the numbers of 400,000 people per month were before the new one. But this is the things you can do if you don't invest all your money in roads. That's what I'm trying to say. For transport, the most important thing is density. More and more important than to discuss subways or buses. Subways are very big problem, but it's not because people are dumb that they go to the suburbs, it's because they are, they, they are seeking uh, to have green, to have children riding their bicycles safely. But suburbs are terrible because for the older people, I mean, they're completely, who cannot drive, or for children, I mean, for somebody who is 15, the famous soccer moms in the United States who have to, so suburbs, of course, for many reasons, we don't have, you, many of you study this thing, so clearly low density development makes it impossible to provide low-cost, high-frequency public transport. If, if Bogota, Bogota has one of the highest densities in the world at this time, like 220 inhabitants per hectare. It's almost like Manhattan. If we had Atlanta's density, we would have almost 20 times the area that we have now for the same population. So it would be impossible to provide low-cost, high-frequency public transport. But not only for the, for the, so this is the kind of thing that is happening in many Latin American and developing countries, this American type of service. Again, everywhere, I'm sure in the London School of Economics, in every planning school in the planet, they realize this is the biggest mistake. But they continue to build them all the time. And in Mexico, for example, they have found that the Infonavit, which is a wonderful institution, which builds uh, formal housing for the lower income people, uh, has found that sometimes up to 15% of the homes they have sold are empty because the people prefer to leave the homes empty and to go and rent a room closer to downtown because it's too far and too expensive and so. This is all over, this is in Manila, I mean everywhere. It is. So density does not mean, of course, uh, 20 story high buildings, it can be like this very quickly, let's go quickly. Uh, When people use, I mean, I w if we would achieve, you know, a revolution that in the developing countries would understand that uh, to progress, to advance, is not to have more people using cars, <coughs> is not to have the lower income people using more cars, but to have the higher income people using public transport. But this is not what we understand there yet. But if people use public transport, why do people use public transport in London? It's not because they love public transport. It's because they have to because it's very slow or there is congestion charge or there is no place to park. So if we want people to use public transport, we have to have good public transport and we also have to restrict car use somehow. <coughs> but let's go quickly. Well, and I don't want to go into this. In Bogota, we started to restrict car use through tag numbers. I'm going to go quickly because. But something that is interesting is that we establish a car-free day, the first Thursday of every February, the seven million inhabitant city where the whole day no cars in this city. And the city works fine. It's a fantastic experiment. The whole day, a 7 million inhabitant city, but we had asked something even more radical. We had asked in this referendum for people if they wanted to completely ban cars, all cars, during two peak hours in the morning and two peak hours in the afternoon, beginning the year 2015. And of course, there were some big businessmen who were against this, but they, they, they made a big campaign against it. But they knew they were going to lose. So they did not campaign for people to vote no. But for a referendum to be valid, ma mandatory, it has to have more than 33.3% of the potential voters' participation. So what they asked people in this huge advertising campaign was for people not to vote. And we missed it by one, one thousand. Of, uh, uh, otherwise, we would have a very interesting scheme. No cars at all during peak hours, two peak hours in the morning, two peak hours in the afternoon. But at least we have this experiment every February, in, it's in, a, in next week or in a couple of, a few weeks from now. Car free day, uh, let's go quickly. 
Bicycles, again, bicycles are extremely important everywhere in the world. They are going to become more and more important. But this, again, is political. Why do we have more bicycles in the Netherlands than in Spain or in Italy, when the weather is much better in Spain or in Italy? <laughs> Clearly, I think it's because Italy and Spain are much less egalitarian societies. Uh, the big businessman in Spain, in Spain, they think it's too important to go on a bicycle, of course. You know, it's like a Colombian one. And, well, uh, when a billionaire in the Netherlands couldn't care less, he goes in, a, in an old bicycle. And, and so, but this is very powerful too. I would say, this is uh, the future of cities, I would say, especially in the developing world where we don't all have winters. Uh, <laughs> except a few cities like Ulaanbaatar, but mostly we don't have winters. So the question is, is a protected bicycle way a cute architectural feature, or is it a right? I would say it's a right, because otherwise it means that the only people who have a right to mobility without the risk of getting killed are those who own a car, something which would not be very democratic. I think the important thing, in Bogota we were able to go from 0% of people using bicycles to almost 5% now, and I would say at least half of the stimulus was because uh, it increased the social status of cyclists. I mean, a protected bicycle way shows that a citizen on a $30 bicycle is equally important to one on a $30,000 car. And of course, many people were very upset that we would take space away from car park or whatever. It was a big battle, even though it's a minority of people who uses cars. Ideally, it should be continued at grade. Uh, let's go quickly. This is the kind of things that. Look, if we had fuel, let's say in London there was war or an earthquake or something, and we had fuel only for 5% of vehicles in London. To whom would we give the fuel? I mean, unless we are, want to commit suicide, we would give the very scarce fuel to buses and trucks so that the city works. If we decide to give it to whoever can pay more for it and to give it to a few cars, we will starve. As simple as that. So it would be mad. So now let's ask a different question, but very similar. If there was space, road space, only for 5% of the vehicles, to whom would you give this space? I think a democratic city should give this space, and not only a democratic, a city that wants to survive and is not mad, should give this space to public transport and bicycles and pedestrians. <coughs> Upper income citizens in developing countries, they all want subways, very madly. They have not the slightest intention of using them most of the time. But they think they will put low-income people in underground so that they will not take space away from their cars <laughs> with the buses. You know? Uh, is there a Mexican people here? You know? I'm sure, I'm sure you could ask your Mexican friends here whether I am lying or not. Of course, in some more advanced developing countries, like in Sao Paulo, you find more upper-income people using them. But it's very often. Another thing. In Singapore, I was telling because the people in Singapore were telling me, oh, how they are the best in the planet in everything, the brightest, the most democratic. I mean, and, uh, and so they have fantastic subway. You know, this, I say, I mean, if you are so democratic and you really believe that public transport should have priority, why do you give these wonderful highways with full of flowers and gardens and everything to private cars and you put public transport users on the ground like rats? <laughs> why don't you give public transport exclusive lanes or things on at, at level at, in the surface so that they can go and enjoy public transport and its benefits, but also enjoy the scenery and the natural light and all of this. These are things that we can start to discuss. Uh, but anyway, race systems were completely out of our reach. For example, now it's been discussed in Bogota where we built a subway line, 20 kilometer subway line. London has 1,800 kilometers of subway and rail. And still they move, by the way, one million more passengers by bus than by subway and rail. But we would build at the most 20 kilometers for the same population, basically for the same population as London. 
less than 2%, like 1.5% of what London has. It would solve nothing. But we would be completely broke for the next 30 years. I mean, it would be great to have subway. It would be wonderful to have many subway lines. It's a fantastic system. But the problem is, if we only have 2 or $3 billion for the next 30 years, what can we do? This may be good for a 20, 20 kilometer subway line. You know, the whole property tax in Bogota collected every year is only $400 million. Like a joke. I mean, it's like what you. <laughs> so we created this system, copied from Curitiba in Brazil, which I think is a very powerful symbol of democracy. One of the most beautiful, this is a system that is moving, by the way, more passengers our direction than 95% of rail systems in the world. Is moving more passengers our direction than all subways except for six or seven. But it costs, while an underground subway may cost 200, 250 million dollars kilometer, this costs 10 million dollars kilometer. So uh, this works like a subway, basically. People pay when they enter the station, but the interesting thing is that this is a very powerful democratic symbol. We say we are going to give road space in priority to public transport. Let's go quickly. I'm going to go quickly. But even if we build a few subway lines, the only way to reach a whole city is with buses. So I, I don't want to go into this, but this is a very interesting democratic symbol. Buses in a traffic jam, cars in a traffic jam, and buses with lower income people zooming by next to them. <laughs> That's democracy at work. It's democracy not just the fact that people go vote. And then the feeder system going to the poorest neighborhoods in Bogota. Then in many, in seven Colombian cities, they have built systems like this. In many others in the world, in Jakarta, this one, Brisbane, this is one that just opened in Guangzhou. It's moving more passengers our direction than all subway lines in China, except for line two of Beijing. So these are the fascinating thing about this system is that basically, if we, this proves that transport is a political decision. It's not a technical decision. If we are ready to give priority in the use of road space to public transport, we solve the problem very quickly. Of course, it's, not so, it's easier said than done. Uh, sometimes you need to get cars out of the street altogether. People sometimes say, oh, here this is too narrow, this street, so we cannot put the bus system through here. So what we have to tell them is, this is a democracy. So what we have to do is that there is no space for cars, not that there is no space for buses. So this is in Bogota downtown, or this is in the Netherlands. But let's imagine a new city. Imagine a new city in Asia or in Africa. Why not have hundreds of kilometers of streets just for buses and bicycles? It's very easy to do it from the start. There is no conflict, because we are talking about the new areas to be built. So easy to do. It costs nothing. It's just a matter of a little thinking, a little different, not just copying what has been done elsewhere. Very quickly, in Pereira, Bogota. Buses in highways, like in Turkey here, in Istanbul, or in Bogota, or in Madrid, I don't have time for this. Let's go quickly to other things. How much more time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> 15, OK. I'll go running quickly. <laughs> this is Tokyo in the Middle Ages. <coughs> Any child could walk for many blocks without fear of getting killed, even when they put Rails for, tra tra for trams. This is Modena in Italy, the same. Very sophisticated cities, richer than most developing country cities today, like Paris. You know, it's not like before cars there was no civilization. It's not like it was in the Stone Age before cars. You know, <laughs> Beethoven had already composed his music and all kinds of things. You know, <laughs> it's not that we needed cars before we began to have science and music. No. Uh, these were wealthy cities. And then, like this is Paris again, New York, 1905, pedestrian. Then cars begin slowly to encroach and then begin to move people to the sidewalks and after they kick them out to the suburbs. This is in Venezuela, an island off the coast where there are no cars. So children are not conscious that it's dangerous to play in the street because they are not conscious that this is a dangerous place to be. It's a, so is public pedestrian space a frivolity something ridiculous in a developing country? I wouldn't say no, because look, the real difference in income is felt during leisure time. During work time, the high executive and the person who cleans the floor 
they may be equally satisfied or in dissatisfied. The big difference is when they go into their leisure time. The upper income person goes to a large house, to a garden, to a country club, to vacations. And the low income person and his or her children go to a very small house. So the least, the very least that a democratic city should offer to these low income people is quality sidewalks, parks, sports facilities. This is the very least that a democratic, and this is not a minor issue. Is playing a luxury, some kind of ridiculous thing, or is playing something we need to be happy? So, look, this is a very poor neighborhood in Bogota, and the only flat piece of land there in the mountain, they left for a park, even though it was a, 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 a slum, a, a squatter. Of course, in public space, we meet as equals, of course, and this is the kind of parks that we did in Bogota that was very important and, and a big battle. I mean, I'd like you to, sh to see this picture because it's the same as the next one. Space for children, <coughs> the space for cars. It's the same. We do the park and the sidewalks. Of course, I would love to pay the street for cars too, but if you don't have enough money, what do you do first? Again, this is politics. This is ideology. This is not, uh, of course, in these neighborhoods, 99% of the people don't have cars. Look, this is wonderful <coughs> Central Park. When Central Park was created, New York was much poorer and smaller than most developing country capitals in the world today. And they had the vision, and, and this was not a garden made by a king or something. No, this was a democracy at work that thought of doing this. So let me ask you something, for example. Here in Bogota, we had a big problem, a golf course of a private club right <laughs> in the middle of a very high density area. I mean, democracy again is that public good prevails over <coughs> private interest. What do you think is better for general happiness? To have 300,000 people or 400,000 people use this on a Sunday or maybe to have it maybe 1,000? This is clear, you know, but we were able only to turn the polo fields into a park but difficult battles, but the issue is, here this is an interesting picture again. This is Kibera, the biggest slum in Nairobi. Look, there is one of the highest densities in the world, the ho most horrible poverty, and then a golf course here. <laughs> Do you think that's democracy at work? You know, I mean, democracy is not the fact that people go vote. That's just a little part of what democracy is about. So, of course, I think we have to buy land where the city is growing. But no developing country cities are buying land in significant amounts to make big parks, which this land, which is going to be bought in the borders, is going to be the big, uh, it will be in the middle of the cities in the future. Sidewalks, very quickly. Okay. Quality sidewalks, I would say, is the most important element in a democratic city's infrastructure. But this is not that I have to seek very hard to take a picture like this. This you will find everywhere. What makes really the difference between advanced and backward cities is not highways. Many very poor African cities which don't even have running water for half the population have highways. Many very bad cities have a subway line or two. But what really makes a difference between a quality city and a bad one is quality sidewalks. And this is what you find again, you find this all over the developing world. You don't have to be a great explorer to find this. It's all over the place. I would say that we require environmental impact, human impact studies as well, because now we, the World Bank and all these institutions, they, they require that we protect the animals and the lizards and all this. This is great. But we should also protect children. And for example, this road, World Bank Finance, there is much more pedestrians and bicycles than cars, and still they had zero infrastructure for pedestrians. Uh, look at this, this is amazing, this is in Chennai. They made these horrible flyovers all over, completely useless in terms of mobility. And look what they invest, this amount of money for this, and look at the pedestrians. But the, again, I'm not saying this is something that is India's fault. Everywhere in the developing world, this is what really means backwardness in terms of urban design. Very quickly. Cars parked on a sidewalk or parking base where there should be a sidewalk make a city less humane and are a symbol of lack of democracy. Even school children. In Bogota, it was very complicated. I had my bl hair black before this battle. 
to make uh, bigger sidewalks to get, uh, and so people uh, told me, Mayor, you're so stubborn because there is enough space to park cars as well as for people to walk by. So we have to make a TV campaign explaining. We tend to think that sidewalks are relatives of parks because they live next to each other. But in fact, sidewalks are not for going from one place to another. They can be used for that, but sidewalks are for talking, for doing business, for kissing. Really, sidewalks are much closer relatives of parks or plazas than they are of streets. And to say that in a sidewalk there is enough space to make a parking bay as well as to, for people to walk by is as absurd as saying that we can turn a great park or plaza into an open-air parking lot so long as we leave enough space between the cars for people to walk by. <laughs> again, these are subjective issues. This is nothing, uh, again, this is the way it was. Uh, and that's what we did. And that's the way it is now. Anyway, big sidewalks in the lower income neighborhoods, very low income neighborhoods also, big sidewalks. Uh, Ideally, the sidewalk should continue at grade at all intersections, so it is clear that it's the cars that are entering the pedestrian space and not vice versa. Of course, we only did a few of those. Let's go quickly. By the way, these bowlers, I was almost impeached for putting bowlers. In Paris, there are 480,000 bowlers, but when I put a bunch of bowlers in Bogota, it was uh, <laughs> complicated. <laughs> Road space is the most valuable resource in a city. Even if you would find diamonds or oil under a city, it would never be as valuable as road space. The question is how to distribute this extremely valuable resource between pedestrians, bicycles, public transport, and cars. Again, there is nothing technical about it. Look at London. There is more space for pedestrians than for cars. Of course, it's not because the mayor asked permission for some trans transport engineer. I mean, this was basically a political decision at some point that people <coughs> took. Because I'm sure many people they said, oh no, it's better to have cars parked here, and this is going to be our customers. And this is, uh... anyway. Anytime we have cars parked along these sidewalks, what we, again, I'm not, I cannot tell what the New Yorkers should do. But all I can remind them is that there is nothing technical about it. I mean, why, who, have we asked the children? Have we asked the pedestrians? Or have we simply thought that cars are so important that we ha cannot get rid of this parking uh, along the streets? Anyway, let's go quickly. I am not going to go into this. Quickly, sidewalks. This is, this is London sidewalks, wonderful. Or Chancel, he said, we could be Bogota, people who attack me. I'm sure they would tell the French mayor how stupid you are, Mr. Mayor, because there is more than enough space there to build parking bays as well as for people to walk by, you know? Very difficult. Waterfronts. Waterfronts are very crucial elements because they make people happier. But they should have pedestrian spaces. Motorways by waterfronts destroy much of their beauty and charm. Like this is the one that was made by Mr. Pompidou in Paris and there were Lady D was killed and all this and, and uh, uh, now the French said it was very dumb decision to have built this uh, highway and they are trying to close it so the mayor has been uh, closing it as often as possible and even in the summers for like seven years or so they put some sand and some palm trees and they say the Paris beach <laughs> uh, and the idea is to close it all together this is in Boston they demolished, they invested like more than $20 billion to demolish this elevated highway because it was in front of the waterfront. Unfortunately, after they demolished it to create some great pedestrian space, they still put space for cars. I mean, a little after they put the road on the ground, a little dumb. But anyway, uh, this is in Seoul. They invested $9 billion not to build this highway, but to demolish it. And the, the people liked it so much that the mayor now for, who did this is the president of Korea. Uh, so ideally, there should be pedestrian spaces, but in the 20th century, engineers put highways all over the waterfronts because it was the perfect place to put high-velocity roads without intersections. So let's go quickly in, in, uh, in Bonn. This is the way they should be, very quickly. Or in New York, in a good place, there are very bad ones too, but in Bogota, we don't have any wonderful river or lake, but we have <laughs> drainage canals. <laughs> And even then, people like it. <laughs> Look what you can do in a very poor neighborhood. Not exactly the Thames. 
But uh, I mean, the 20th century will be remembered as a disastrous one in urban history because we made cities much more for cars than for people. So towards the 1980s, people began to pedestrianize streets all over the place. And uh, this is wonderful San Sebastian in Spain or in, in Chile, these two blind women, how could they enjoy the city otherwise? This is in New York. Last year, the wonderful Secretary of Transport, Janet Sadiq Khan in New York, just took half the space from Broadway, half the space from Broadway, and made it a pedestrian and bicycle space. And then in some parts, only pedestrian. This is not for a festival. This is permanent. Uh, let's go quickly. This is something interesting that we did in Bogota. This is a 24-kilometer pedestrian and bicycle street promenade. I don't know of anything similar. And this is a very old picture. Now there is city all around it, but it's very difficult to get in a helicopter once you're not a mayor any longer. <laughs> <laughs> but this is 24 kilometers. This is the way this thing is. This also, imagine any new city could have hundreds of kilometers. Imagine for a rich or a poor person to have near where they live, to enter a pedestrian network would completely change their lives. And it costs nothing if we plan it from the start in Kigali, in Rwanda, for example. It's very easy to do. This is again in Bogota. First, this is the typical illegal neighborhood in Bogota. First, we normally they would pay the street for cars. What we did is first the pedestrian space, and then the pavement later. Again, the pedestrian promenade. Look, this, the fancy pedestrian space in underground cables for bicycles, for pedestrians, and the cars in the mall. Uh, again, it's a political decision. Bicycle shops. Again, we build very nice schools and parks. And then here you have the pedestrian, 24 kilometer. It's thousands of people who use this in every day to go to work. And this is uh, where JICA used to, where JICA, the Japanese Cooperation Agency, proposed a highway. We built a 35 kilometer greenway. Let's go very quickly. Another battle with a country club that they wanted to have a wall. So finally, we won that they had to be a transparent enclosure that they don't pay almost any taxes because it's a metropolitan green area. At least they should allow people to see the scenery in exchange for not paying taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, always is inequality what creates problems everywhere. But let's go quickly because we don't have time. This is not just for the poor. This is in Germany, in Munster. Anyway. So I will just say, in every detail, a city should reflect that human beings are sacred. And I will say that in every detail, a city should reflect that citizens are equal. Excuse me for having taken so long. Thank you. Thank you to Enrique for a, uh, a stimulating and, uh, and roving uh, a talk. Um, very much reminded of being, I, somebody may correct me if I'm wrong, the exact details of this, but in Houston a few years ago they finished the fourth beltway for the city, which is known colloquially as the gut buster, and it's the Thomas Jefferson Parkway, um, which uh, brings, I think, the, uh, the beginning of your talk and the end of your talk uh, together in rather oxymoronic uh, uh, sort of irony. Uh, in the uh, interest of uh, public good over private interest, um, I'm going to try and create uh, kind of polyphony rather than cacophony and um, try and cluster questions to, uh, to Enrique, maybe in groups of kind of three. We've got a time for Enrique to kind of collect his thoughts and, and provide us with an answer and then move on to any other uh, questions uh, if there are some. Uh, in the room. So uh, there is no microphone, I'm told. Um, so to that extent, it will be a uh, survival of the fittest uh, in the room. And um, uh, maybe not towards my ideological leanings, but I'm going to start on the right. Um, man with the bicycle t-shirt, I think at least deserves uh, the first voice. With Emiliano Zapata on the back, I mean, what a perfect blend of, uh, of irony and ideology can we have. So if we go here, 
uh, Carlos, and, uh, and then uh, back right. So, please. Okay, well, thank you, Enrique. No developing country city, uh, the subway moves more than 10% of the population. Only in Mexico, which is like 12.3% or something. Uh, so even if you do a few subway lines, you will need a great uh, bus system. <coughs> Subways are great. Of course, it depends on how the political situation is in one country. Lima, for example, is a very big city relative to the next important city in Peru. Uh, in Colombia, there are many important cities. So politically, it's much more difficult to get money from the national government, taking money away from other cities in the country to invest in Bogota. So I believe that, I mean, uh, clearly, I think BRT is not the best solution. It's the only solution. Uh, even if we have a few subway lines, uh, and uh, this is difficult politically, very difficult, and somewhat politically managerially difficult too, but I think it's possible clearly to do some, some system that works well. Uh, in, in, in Bogota, for example, which has had a lot of economic growth and all that in the last 10, ten years, <laughs> and still only 22% of, of homes own cars. But even if everybody, so now, uh, about the cars and bicycles. I'm not saying that people should buy bicycles instead of cars. But I think that clearly uh, we need to restrict slowly, softly, <coughs> car use. The most obvious way to restrict in car use is to getting rid of parking. Here in London, in central London, for about 40 years, even in private buildings, uh, they cannot build uh, parking. Uh, so. Uh, I think that uh, when we are talking, when we are talking about a, a city with very few cars, it sounds like it's the dream of some crazy hippie, you know. But if we were to ask the best developing country students in the best universities in the 50 biggest cities in the developing countries, if they would like to go live in, in London or Paris or New York for a few years, most of them would jump at the opportunity. So, and this basic, they would basically live without cars 
in a carless city. So when we are talking about cities without cars, we are not talking about some crazy utopia. We are talking about cities which already exist. And not only do they exist, but they have the most valuable real estate in the planet. They are the ones that most attract tourists in the planet. And that's where most investors and everybody would like to go. So we are not talking of some crazy uh, uh, utopia. Actually, these cities, of course, this has to take time. When I am talking about, uh, uh, but basically what we would like to do is to restrict car use, not than to restrict car buying. If people, at least in the, in the first stages, if people want to have a car, it's wonderful that they have a car to go out to the countryside on the weekend, or maybe even to go out at night sometimes, but not to go to work using the car every day. In Paris, many people have cars, but they use the public transport every day. So uh, about the rain, look. I, when I was mayor, very often I would find these 70-year-old ladies, high-income ladies that would tell me, ah, you think you're, you're so crazy, you think that I am going to go on a bicycle or something. No, I mean, when we are, if we are just able to get maybe 15% of the population on a bicycle, this is a revolution. We are not talking that everybody is going to use a bicycle. Oil will use public transport. I mean, if we just get 15%, I mean, I would be more than happy, extremely ecstatic, if we would get in Bogota 15% of the people using bicycles. And the fact is, many times, again, this is the, the, the high class perspective. In Colombia, which is a very tropical country, except for Bogota, which is uh, very high up, I go to, to the cities in the tropical Colombia, which are very hot, <coughs> and the people say, oh, it's impossible to use bicycles here, it's too hot, you know, you think. And I say, why don't you go out and look, you know? The people are there, you know, the poor people are there using bicycles, many, hundreds, thousands of people are there using bicycles. So actually, what do you, if you build a great bicycle infrastructure, you will do two things, you will protect cyclists and you will also give them a new social status. And then, how do we ca maintain the policies? that once you change the mayor and how do you, I was, we were very lucky in Bogota because we were a group of mayors that for about th three or four mayors, we continued one doing, I continued what I had done Antanas Mokus before, and Antanas continued what I did and Lucho Garzon also and so, to a large degree, but w that's why I am here, you know? Because I hope to convince, I mean you, I am absolutely certain that very soon, you are going to be running your cities and your countries. This is why I am here, it's, you know, because I am trying to convince you of a few things. So we have to really change the vision. So once that people really begin to, to imagine that there is something different that can be better. Of course, initially it's difficult because we need some examples, but the only real way to make this sustainable is to get a much more educated society about the, the a shared vision. That's the only way, because see, otherwise, in any moment, we still have this huge threat from the upper income groups. The only thing they want is more roads. And now, for example, there is a big threat to developing country cities because there are private highways being built through the cities. And so now the, the obstacle of, of budgetary constraints does not even exist any longer. And uh, the upper income people want the uh, highways. These highways, of course, are not built through the upper income neighborhoods because this is, they, they are going, they're built through the lower income neighborhoods. The big construction companies support this very much, the financial institutions. So we, the only way is to create a vision. And this is why I'm here, because I'm sure you're going to have a lot of power in your countries and in your cities. Can we swing maybe to our left, at least? <laughs> Um, chap in the uh, pink shirt here, then in front of the scarf, and then red and white stripes so in that order. Keep your questions short and singular. Um, cyclists here who are very much a minority in uncertain um, design facilities, such as those we provide in Bogota, and we do have that lack of political will at the top. So, as a politician, how would you recommend constituents who want what you've given go about convincing their politicians? I don't know if I understood well the question, but here in these advanced countries, one of the things that really makes a difference is the well-organized interest groups. It's amazing. I always try to organize the bicycle users in Bogota to defend this, and it was very difficult. But here, I mean, in San Francisco, for example, I once found that they had an organization of more than 10,000 paying members of a bicycle coalition. So uh, 
I, I think we, we ha really have to begin to change the vision. Again, today, for example, I'm sure everybody agrees that to have a sidewalk or a footpath, as they call it here, or a, a pavement, pavement mm -hmm. is a right. I mean, it's a right. If some pedestrian is hit by a car where there is no footpath, I'm sure they sue government and they get a lot of millions because they, sh they have a right to have a, a footpath. The question is, again, is a protected bicycle way a cute architectural feature or is it a right? So I think we have to start working on this. Uh, this is, we need to have more and more, no, I like, it's when, like when you put a spoon to float on a cup of coffee, a small spoon, and you put one drop, and then the spoon continues to float, float, another spoon, another spoon, and it continues to float, another spoon, and all of a sudden you put one more spoon and it sinks. It's a little bit the same with bicycle infrastructure. Sometimes it's frustrating because you first build some bicycle infrastructure and people don't use it, no? So you really have to build more and more and more until you get really the scale to really completely change the habits, even though initially it may seem like people will not use it. This is what I believe in. Can we cut you and then straight into you, if that's yeah. possible? Yeah. Thanks. Um, one, one of the points that, that you stressed was the fact that decisions about transport investment, like investment in certain types of infrastructure, whether it has to be or it has to do with rail or roads or cycling infrastructure, is political. I think, uh, happily, the world, I think, is changing. In Bogota, when we arrived there, practically, I would say there was not one decent sidewalk in the whole city. Cars were parking all over the place. But now we had many, many <coughs> young people studying urban design, urbanism, and, and the, I would think it would be in, unimaginable that we would do at least a new road without a good sidewalk. Uh, maybe the old ones will take a long time before they get a good one. But <coughs> so. Uh, I am optimistic that the world is going in the right direction. You see more of this everywhere in the world, <laughs> in Paris, in London, in Mexico, everywhere a little bit, of course. You know, the problem is the Netherlands and Denmark, they are not sexy enough, you know? <laughs> they have had a fantastic thing for many years, but nobody cares, you know? <laughs> But once Paris does something, or New York, ah, oh, then everybody wants to do the same. And I think that's wonderful. <laughs> we need to get London and Paris and New York to do more of this because everybody else will follow. Okay. Uh, Enrique, I, I share with you the financial concerns about the construction of the subway in poor countries such as Colombia. But I am a daily user of the tube, and I not, do not feel like a rat. Instead, I feel very glad of seeing drunk people, handicaps, uh, artists in the tube. So I am also, I, 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 in my sense is that using the tube in London is a very way of, uh, is a very good way of knowing the people and interacting with the people. Yes, my I agree. Question is, I mean, question is very simple. The line in Bogota, the first line, goes through the east part of the city, the richest part of the city, to the south. No, no, but I go to the south. It goes only to San Victorino. Well, yeah. to the, well, but the central part of the city, a very poor city, I mean, a very poor part in of a city, city you know, in a city where only maybe ten percent of the people are high and middle income, something like ninety percent of the route goes through higher and middle income. But you don't think that a tube system can also be a way of integrating socially a city? I mean, I think subways are wonderful if people use them. Again, as I mentioned, in some places in developing countries, people use them. Uh, the upper income people use them. In others, they don't. For example, in Mexico City, very few upper, upper middle class people use the subway. Very few, almost none. Sao Paulo is different. Uh, but uh, of course, subways are wonderful. Oh, yeah, I, I, I made a mistake to, to say that this is, but all I'm saying is that it's nicer to be out in the surface. This is one of the, I mean, we, we don't have time to go into this because, but bus systems are not just cheaper. I think they have many advantages, uh, some disadvantages. But for example, uh, stations are much closer together. So you don't have uh, the, the walking time from origin of the trip to the station and from the station to destination is shorter. 
when you have a subway system and you have to change lines, you have to get off and walk and wait for the next one. In bus system, they change line without you having to waste time. And one of the things, look, when I was a student in Paris, as you, I used to work at a hotel all night near uh, Champs-Élysées, uh, uh, Hotel Ceramique in Avenue Bagram. <laughs> all night, like 13 hours, four nights a week. And uh, after I would come out very tired, I had to go to university the next day. And at that time, I couldn't care less about this bus or subway or thing. It's not because of principle or anything. Not ideological decision. I prefer to take the bus or the longer elevated uh, subway route because I wanted to see the city. It was nice, even though it would take much longer. So I th I'm just saying, I mean, if we can have subways, it's great, wonderful. The only problem is, what is more effective for solving Bogota's mobility? 20% of subway or 300 kilometers, 20 kilometers of subway or 300 kilometers of, of this system. I would love to have both. Okay, so a couple of questions at the front here. Um, you and then Sylvia. Thank you. Um, I would like to know now that you're working on the building up and strengthening of the Green Party in Colombia with former Mayor Marcus and Garzon. How are you linking the citizen culture approach to this, uh, to making the city more inclusive for, for all? How does it come into the picture? Okay, I will take a few questions now. to get people into public spaces. <coughs> First of all, I think we have to get people out. The thing that will make it safer is to get more people out. We have very bad design problems. For example, in Bogota, until very recently, we had this crazy urban regulation, which uh, gave a new, uh, an extra story high to buildings which put parking in the first floor. It's crazy, so that people would walk and what makes cities safe is that people are seen from the private spaces and vice versa, things like this. So I believe that in, in we have to, walls are crazy. Uh, we, we do walls really destroy the quality of cities and we have so many walls. Even if we're going to put enclosures, I would say, I mean, I prefer not to have enclosures, just to put some uh, bars on the windows in the first floor. You find bars in London or in Paris and things in the first floors of many buildings, but uh, at least they should be transparent enclosures and not walls. So that there is, there are many things that can be done uh, to make uh, the public space more attractive. And uh, it has to do also with police, but there is something that is fascinating. In Bogota, the murder rate went down from about 82 per 100,000 inhabitants to about 18 per 100,000 inhabitants. And not because of the Uribe war against the drugs or anything, just because things that were done in the city. And uh, I believe it has a lot to do with legitimacy. When people feel respected, uh, they tend to obey the law more and to denounce more those who break the law and also more order in the public space. And then uh, this also helps me to go into the other question which was asking, most parts that we did, we just, it was sometimes with parks which already existed. Some others we bought the land, uh, the land that was there. 
but the one I think you are have in mind is one in downtown, two blocks from the presidential palace, from the Ministry of Finance, from the mayor, from the Palace of Justice. We had the most horrible drug crime ridden area, uh, the highest murder rate in the planet, the most horrible things used to happen there. For example, when I was mayor, a four-year-old boy was raped and castrated. This is the kind of horrible things that used to happen there all the time. So it was, and then it was killing downtown because this was growing like a cancer. It was uh, 23 hectares and growing. And so we demolished 23 hectares of this horror. And we had, of course, we spent more in social programs, uh, rehabilitation programs, uh, all kinds of things than in the physical per se, but to create a park in order to try to get more people into downtown. We need, and this goes to the inclusion, we need every possible thing to have a city more inclusive, that we need the downtown of the city that people should go, want to go there, to parks, to, and need to live there. So this was a very difficult thing. We had to demolish more than 600 buildings, but it was more crime. The police would not enter there. This was not that you demolish the house of poor people. No, this was mafia, drugs. I mean, people, some, in this process, three policemen were killed in this thing. Sometimes they, they threw military grenades at the police. Uh, the police would not enter there unless it was in huge operatives. Uh, so uh, this is one case that we did. Uh, and uh, uh, how, what to do to include the poor and women? Many things. I would say one thing that is fascinating that I think we must remember is that it's different to help the poor than to construct equality. These are two different things. You can give alms to the poor, but this does not construct equality on the country. Or you can give free food to the poor. Maybe this is necessary, and we do a lot. But this does not construct equality on the country. This destroys human dignity and self-esteem. Uh, so if we build a fantastic library uh, in a very poor neighborhood, this is also a message or a fantastic school. I mean, when we build a fantastic school in a very poor neighborhood, beautiful building that is the most beautiful building in these very poor slums, this is also a message that children and education are important. You say, oh, this is obvious. It's not so obvious because, for example, in Colombia, as for the last study, maybe it has changed a little. Uh, Two out of four children that are born are not wished for at the moment of conception. One out of every four children are not wished for even at the moment of birth. In the low-income neighborhoods, close to 20% of the children don't even know who their father is. So we have to, architecture and the city constructs behaviors, constructs, I mean, a city speaks. Why did people used to construct cathedrals? Why, I mean, when I really, I love this history of cathedrals in Europe, I always have loved it because they used to take 200 years and more to be built, but not because there were problems with the contractors, <laughs> As it, but because they were <coughs> designed to take 200 years to build. It's amazing. What do we have today as a, in a, that we are going starting to build for 200 years from now or even 50 years from now? But more than that, there was always a big debate where the money should be given to the poor in arms or to build the cathedral. It was very interesting because, of course, it was religious. So I think the cathedral constructed equality. It got the rich and the poor people, maybe in some special fancy seats, the rich, or whatever, they meet together. And the same with the libraries. And so when you get cars out of sidewalks, when you make a bus system that is accessible to wheelchairs, uh, everything that will be respectful to to children, to the elderly. Uh, so you are constructing symbols, uh, symbols that, are, that communicate a message, that they talk. And I think they help to educate the society. Okay, one more round of questions, at least. We'll see then if there's another one. If we go here uh, to Carlos, uh, this person I promised, and hand at the back there. Uh, maybe there'll be one more round after. Off you go. Uh,
Okay, thank you. I will try to run, but I'm a very bad candidate. But, <laughs> but uh, somebody, maybe Antanas Mokos will also run. Uh, so we'll have, a, as we did the last time, a very friendly primary, very constructive. Just, and if he wins or I win, whatever, I'm sure we can, whoever doesn't will help the other one in government. Uh, I do believe that we have to construct institutions because uh, it's amazing what the, dam the damage that a mayor who in Colombia you can arrive to City Hall and you can fire everybody. Uh, and you can appoint some corrupt people and uh, so you don't know what is worse. If you not to be able to fire the bad ones or not being able to appoint the good ones. So, but clearly we, I think basically when we talk about corruption and all of this, the most important thing is to do different way of, different way of doing politics. Uh, and actually, uh, well that's what in Colombia or Green Party, more than the environmental aspects, which also are important, very important to us, is the fact that we wa are completely against the traditional ways of politicking and corruption and buying votes and things like this. And, uh, and also to try to say the truth as much as possible, because almost everything that you say that is res responsible is bad for getting votes. Uh, but anyway, uh, about Moscow, I don't know the weather of Moscow really, but uh, I'm sure many people could, could still walk. Uh, I, I think that, uh, I don't know what the difference is, but for example, in, if you have five months of snow, it's different, but in Denmark, for example, it's very cold and still many people use bicycles. Uh, but of course, each society has to solve its own uh, needs. And uh, what I do believe is that it's very sad when shopping malls replace public space as a meeting place for people. Because imagine uh, if you, shopping malls in developing countries, they are almost a country club. Uh, they are designed to keep out the low-income people. It's like if I go to the Lamborghini or the Rolls-Royce shop and I am going to meet with my son and we're going to see these $500,000 guys and we are very afraid that they will ask us, can I help you, sir? And then we are prepared to say, oh, no, thank you, I'm just looking, you know. <laughs> but then they maybe also tell me, well, this is not a museum, sir. You know? <laughs> but anyway, in developing countries, the uh, shopping malls, to a large degree, are a means to exclude low-income people because they feel uncomfortable there, and in some cases, even the guards kick them out if they have certain images. Uh, but even if they don't kick them out, they just don't feel comfortable. So, but in shopping malls, imagine if you, great cities don't have shopping malls. You see London doesn't have shopping malls that I know in the center, and if it does, it uh, probably will go broke. Uh, in New York, I mean, you have 10 degrees below zero in New York, and nobody goes, in, there is no shopping malls, you know. Or in Rome, or in Madrid, you may have 40 degrees in the summer, and still you don't have uh, shopping malls. Imagine if somebody would be blindfold you, blindfold you, and put you in a shopping mall, and you don't know wh where it is. You don't know in which country in the world you are, you know, if you're in Poland, or in Thailand, or in Turkey, or in Colombia, or in Texas, because with the globalization, all these shops are the same. The temperature is kept at the same temperature all over the world, the shop and so. Uh, so clearly, if you, what is it that you ask people when you go to a city you don't know? You ask the concierge of the hotel, where is there a nice place to go walk and see people? And if the concierge tells you, go to the mall, of course, you never go back to that city again because of those. Uh, so I hope that Moscow does not solve this issue just with shopping malls. Uh, but uh, at least maybe there are ways to, to do shopping malls that are much more integrated to public space. And this is a long story. But uh, I will talk about last to finish. Uh, and I am extremely thankful to you for your generosity with your time and interest. Uh, in Sao Paulo, the same thing has happened in Colombia. Hundreds of people have been dying over the last few weeks and months because of the rains. Uh, some s s landslides and the rivers uh, overflow and the people get killed. But even if they don't get killed, 
the fact is that half of what are today Colombian cities sprung up illegally, illegally, in the wrong places, uh, without public spaces. And so even if they don't die, they will live without parks, without in some very high places where you have to use uh, a lot of fuel to go up. Uh, I believe that the market, private property and the market, do not work in the case of growing cities. I believe that capitalism and the private property are the best way to manage most of society's resources. But it does not always work. What happens? The beauty of capitalism is that, for example, if the price of tomatoes goes up, then people grow more tomatoes and the price of tomatoes goes down, or with computers, whatever, no? But in the case of land around growing cities, you can increase the price all you want of the land and the supply of land that is accessible to transport, to education, to water, to jobs, does not increase. So there is no justification whatsoever. This is why we have slums. I mean, we have slums all over the developing world, in India, in uh, Thailand, in Brazil, in Bogota, everywhere. So it cannot be that the mayors or the presidents were stupid or thieves, because impossible that everywhere in the planet, everybody was stupid and a thief. Clearly, there is a problem with the system. The system of private property and the market does not work in the case of growing cities for the land. It does not work. And I do believe that uh, we are too late. In, in, the, in Scandinavia, since 1904, since 1904, the land around cities belongs to government. Uh, and uh, which in Latin America, we, we will have much, much better cities with big parks, with big uh, infrastructure, really well located, and all these crazy things where people die and they live. How many millions of people will grow up in this place? I mean, when you build a city, you are affecting the happiness of people for many generations, for millions. I mean, if you are able to live a 30 or 40 or 50 hectare park, millions of people for the next thousand years will be happier for it. And if you are not able to save this land for a park, but is built over, then this opportunity for people to become happy is lost for the next thousand years. So I do believe that Latin America failed miserably, and we, did, we will have much better cities, much, much better planned, much better location. We st I still think we should do it, but we are very late. And I hope that in Asia and Africa, they should learn from these mistakes that we did in Latin America because they could do much better cities mm -hmm. if they have a much more radical intervention in the land around the cities. Anyway, thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Enrique. We'd like to thank you.